Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Mark Mansfield. I uh, have a question about brand and culture. A uh, comment came up earlier about recruiting in this economy and how important culture is in that uh, in that economy. Um, I currently work for iHeart. I'm in a new position specifically dedicated to helping military service recruiting. I'm a strategist dedicated to helping you guys. Uh, I spent five years in the Army, uh, boots on the ground, so I'm in a unique position to be the person on the other side of the table when friends and family are asking, what do you think about my son or daughter joining military service? I find myself in opposition to my wife. I find myself in opposition to other family members defending what I love, what everybody in this room loves, right? Uh, there's no lack of passion for those of us who have served and believed in it. Uh, but when you think about brand, the Army is one of the largest brands, advertising brands in the world. Budget is not the issue. Culture is a big challenge. And the problem with brand, when you're not constantly thinking about it, is the consumer marketplace takes over that brand for you, right? And the loudest voices, what social media has taught us, is the loudest voices in the room are the trolls. Social media is an echo chamber for complaining and for, for whining and for elucidating problems. I know, having been in the military for five years and now have a, a successful career outside of the military, that the military set me up for more success than I could have thought possible. The reason I joined is I was in the same position as most recruits are uh, in the bulk of recruit talent that we're looking for. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I grew up in a small town in western New York. I could pay for college and try to figure it out, then end up with some debt, or I could take the adventure of a lifetime and map out what happens next, right? But I knew that if I took the step to the Army, I wouldn't have to worry about what the next three, four, five years held. What I didn't think about, but I tell all the people that I mentor now, because I continue to mentor uh, people transitioning out, particularly first and second tour, is that there is a ton of opportunity that the Army prepares you for that nobody's talking about. So back to my question of culture and brand, as we look to the next five years, brand takes a long time. Brand is a long tail initiative engagement. Are we thinking about building a brand that principals and teachers and parents and aunts and uncles can be proud of so that we service members who are standing up for why someone should join, there's a strong enough brand presence behind that that says, yes, bad things happen, but look at how many people we employ. Look at the amazing things that have happened. Look at all these people who have graduated out of even one or two tours and are changing the world. Sorry for the long question. I'll, I'll begin. I'd like to, ma'am, go ahead. I've talked too much. I'll no, start. no, you have no, you have not. I'm living a I was just, I was going to add on to that because I think the, the question is really important. If you think about it in two aspects, one is how do you use data, right, to figure out what all your stakeholders think about, right? So, so I think sometimes we underestimate data. What we're doing with a lot of our clients is using that data, looking, holding focus groups or stakeholder groups, making sure we understand, we truly understand what people are thinking about a brand, right? So, so I, I would just encourage using that data. I think the other is, it's interesting, we talked about this a little bit earlier today as we were um, preparing, is the, um, you described as opportunities. We do the same thing as a firm. We, a lot of the reasons why some of these young folks out of college come to work at EY is because they know whether they stay for one year or whether they stay for a lifetime and retire, we are preparing them and developing them and training them to be the leaders in corporate America. And, and I think that's really important because it, that you can have multiple careers, like you could have multiple careers in the Army too, right? We have multiple careers within EY. And there's an attractiveness we don't have, I mean, sometimes people walk in the door and say, I can't wait to be a partner. Others are like, I know it's going to be a great experience. And so we as a firm really focus on that experience because we want them walking out the door, one being advocates to t potentially their clients, and then be they become alumni. And I will tell you, I'm amazed at all the, you know, the alumni here. It's such a valuable gem. And just how do you mine it and how do you, um, you know, use that for referrals. So I just, I, it, it struck me because we, the data I think is really important to understand what people are thinking and not assume you know. And then secondly, it is, it is a tremendous opportunity to say how much you learn and how much you give, but also, you know, what, what, what's next. So just, I just wanted to add that. Before oh, thank you, you Julian, spot on. And so one, thanks for your service and we can re-enlist you if you'd like to come back in, yeah, no problem. <laughs> But Sir, I think I, I can sign that waiver, you can, too. You can, you can, you can authority. 
But uh, you, you really had highlighted some great points. We mentioned in the opening comments that this crisis also gives us the opportunity to, one, as you just said, uh, clearly communicate not to only those future soldiers that may want to join and learn more about it, but their parents, their coaches, their everybody else, uh, that the influencers that, that can speak to it as well. So yes, I'm, I'm very positive uh, that our, our senior leaders in our Army are looking at an Army brand as well, and I won't get ahead of the senior leaders. I learned that early in school. Uh, but also, message all the positive opportunities to the soldiers that may want to come in and their parents as well. Uh, some of my team has heard this already, but I've got to tell the one. Uh, I, I was actually approached by a future soldier before who just wanted to be a cook, period. So I shared with him, yeah, you can come in and be a cook. There's 149 other jobs you can do also and get you certified at the culinary arts school that the Army runs. No, didn't know that. Did not know that. And if you want to be a cook and jump out of planes, we can do that too. <laughs> uh, I say that jokingly, but that offers the opportunities that should be shared. Yes. And, uh, and lastly, partnering with our other commands are helping us to showcase those opportunities and abilities. Or the young specialist that's done it, or the lieutenant, go back to your hometown and share that as well. So I really appreciate what you said, especially from the perspective of being a soldier and a civilian now that sees it from that end of the kitchen table. Thanks. Sure. General Davis, um, you mentioned uh, you've got more help than you can handle right now. Uh, to that end, uh, I'm, I'm here for you. If, if you have thoughts, questions, bringing military service and advertising experience, I'm here to help. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. It's amazing. I, I'm watching the time, and, and I want to make sure we get all these questions. I'm going to actually take two questions here. So the, the first two on this side, if you'll both ask your questions, and then the panel will address. Thanks. Thank you for setting the stage for me. Hi, I'm Francis. I retired in um, 2012 after 30 years. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I retired in 2012 after 30 years. I was uh, Sergeant First Class and then retired as an officer in the Army Nurse Corps. I was one of the uh, few and lucky select of those who were uh, pulled out of retirement for the COVID mission. Kind of helped reset my thinking. And I have a few things, and I'll try to keep it straight because he said a lot of them. So on day one of AUSA, I went to the Women's Forum. Unbelievable, Phyllis included. And I just sat there and I looked at them, these women and what they had to say. And I'm like, rock stars, right across. Everybody, and everybody in this room, everybody here, who sees us? And I'll get to that. So one of the comments that they made was 22% of the force is female, which is fabulous. But 85% of the force comes from the family members of our military servicemen and women. So again, I say, how can we have the rest of our country and the world see us for who we are today? And so that takes me to the most far-reaching platform that influences and entertains and enlightens people to see us for who we are in today's army and the army of 2030. That's the film and television um, stage. That's, I remember a young lady saying to me in the airport because I was in uniform and she said, she wouldn't leave me alone. She just had so many questions. She said, the only way I know about the military is through army wise. I met her mother, she said the same thing. And so I know personally that film and television can change the, the trajectory of our life. I watched Private Benjamin in 1980 and in, in October, in November, I raised my hand. It was because back then, you know, I didn't want to be defined by the man that I married. I needed my own life and I went out. And so I just feel like people need to see the diversity, what we're doing and and I just think it's all amazing. So my question to you is, is there a plan when you look at film and television, because um, what was it, uh, 12 Strong was the last Army movie out. Top Gun had huge recruiting. If you have a plan, I'd love to hear it. If you do and you don't, please let me help you. <laughs> or be part of it, I should say. Um, I, I can start. Hang I on, think, hang um, on, hang on, ma'am. Oh, yes. Yeah. Question number two, come on up. Let's ask another question. And we're going to have to roll these in together. Okay. Uh, my name is Second Lieutenant Lady, and I'm from New Mexico. 
And originally I came up, though I addressed the Army National Guard uh, panel for recruiting and retention yesterday, and I came up with a different uh, question that I had today or suggestion, thing for consideration, then a major general came up to me and asked me to reiterate what I did yesterday. And when a major general tells a second lieutenant to ask a question, I will. <laughs> and, and so the question that I posed yesterday for the board, though it was already acted upon quickly, was uh, as an E5, uh, I worked for recruiting and retention for years. As an E5, I ran the state's uh, retention program and so have a, a passion for uh, retention. In tutoring about 100 applicants to pass the ASVAB, and, and as you probably know, and if this is outdated information, I apologize, but they did a pilot study in about 1980 where they got their initial uh, test pilot group of thousands of people together, and that's how they set their mean, right? And so they took everybody together and said, okay, that's where 50 is, it's not uh, 50%. And then they repeated that study in 1997, and with the same uh, uh, number of, of uh, people to do the uh, test on, and then they reset that mean to the new 50. So since 1997, if that test has been recreated, then it's not anywhere that I can find. What has changed since 1997? Now my third grader is handed a calculator, meaning we have, I've, t I've actually tutored honor roll students that do not know their times tables. We have professionals in the community I've tutored that do not know their times tables. This is actually the only test, the ACT, the SAT, the GED allow you, allow you to bring in a calculator. The GRE has a four function calculator on the computer. And when you go to the ASFAB website, then it says there is maybe a situation in which you will have had to have known your multiplication table and to have been successful. We are talking about modernizing the Army for 2023, but this is antiquated, and I've spoken to many combat arms and non-combat arms jobs, and nobody has said that their mission has failed because they did not know what eight times seven was. And so with that, now I will say already, Major General Bissell was assigned to uh, work with me on this, and I submitted a white, uh, sir, I submitted a white paper to her this morning so if you see that come across, I would ask for the consideration, and if nothing else, to put together a new way to set that, that medium, that, 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 uh, that 50, that mean. And, uh, and of course, I'd also say that if you were worried about, for example, artillery or something where you think it would be necessary, if you put a four-function calculator on there, you could code it to where every time they tap the calculator, you would also be able to factor that into their score. So there, there are options, there are workarounds. <laughs> Uh, and then what I actually came up here to say is that in the National Guard, and forgive me, I started in the reserves and then I moved to the Guard, so I don't really know the active um, side of things. But in the Guard, um, I have done now analysis of over a thousand interviews of people that have left and or were planning to leave or why they would stay. And I found commonalities. Um, I, I analyzed the data and I submitted it up to my leadership. And people are leaving because of two things. National Guardsmen, in order to be content, need three things. They need a leader, a friend, and a job, or a purpose, you know. And so they're leaving because either they did not find the leadership that they needed, and or they did not have the purpose or the job. Despite what anybody thinks about the younger generation, they actually don't want to get paid to do nothing. And so when they sit on their phones Saturday and Sunday, I was in the band, so I was tasked all over the state, so I didn't even know that there are people sitting on their phones. And, and so now then when I'm in the armory and I see that, and then I see, well, I didn't get out because I don't mind that I signed up and I'm not with my spouse or my children, but now I'm not with my spouse and my children and I'm not doing anything. Couple that with my colleague, Captain Jewell, and I walked around the AUSA, the exhibit hall, and we found all of these phenomenal tie-ins that the Guard is unaware of. I've served for 14 years, you served for nine years. We didn't know half of what was down there in the exhibit hall between membership to the YMCA, they'll record you reading books to your, to your family members, they'll give you tutor 24 seven, all these things. And I designed the retention brief for the state of New Mexico and I didn't know. And as well as possibly even tying in spouses into credentialing assistance. All these things that we have opportunities to do that could create that purpose. And so to make a short question long or a long question short is that is that I would ask a request uh, an acknowledgement of perhaps 
teaching leaders, you know, future leaders like myself, current leaders, to empower their E6s. I mean, NCOs, right? You know, if your squad's sitting around, here's six training binders, pick one, go do the things, play capture the flag in the motor pool. Let's see if you still know how to plot an azimuth. But then, and then I think we'll see some of that retention. They'll understand, they'll have the why, the purpose to, to um, raise the right hand continuously. Thank you for your consideration. I don't know about you guys, but I take 50 second lieutenants just like that. Oh, <laughs> that's amazing. I'll need a job at some point, ma'am. <laughs> well, you come find me when you're ready. Um, so two things. Are we looking at using um, entertainment industry for branding and for purpose? And second, the ASVAB and retooling the kit. So I can start um, just on the, so first, thank you for your service um, and uh, very proud of the, the growth and the number of women that we see serving over um, the last several years. And I think this weekend is the 25th anniversary of the Women in uh, Service Memorial. Um, and that's a huge accomplishment there. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of work done by um, General Wilma Vaught uh, to make that successful. So we're very proud of that. Um, I completely agree with you. I, I think that um, oftentimes, and our data proves this out, that a lot of people's perceptions about what military service is or isn't is scoped by television and media. Um, there is a very active division uh, of the department and all the services are a part of it that is actively engaged with the media entertainment industry. But of course, we can advise, we can recommend, we can say, hey, if you make these changes, then we'll potentially partner. We don't always control the outcome and that's challenging. And so what we have to do then is to try to balance that um, with making sure that uh, to somebody else's point that we are getting our messaging out there and we are establishing our brand so that we're not letting other people do it for us. And part of that is a layering approach um, because we know that a lot of folks are driven away from the prospect of serving due to those misconceptions. Um, then you really have to start there because before they can even really start to say, well, I want to join the Army or I want to join the Navy or I want to join Army Active versus Army National Guard. You have to get them past the prospect that I'm going to become injured, homeless, assaulted, um, have traumatic brain injury through this act of service. Um, and so what we're trying to do through a layering effect is try to make sure that we have advertising content that just addresses some of those misconceptions by modeling the positive outcomes that we see in service to just get them even thinking about, oh, this might be something I'm interested in doing, followed by robust marketing and advertising strategies from each of the services, um, uh, most notably Army here, that says, and now that you've you know, kind of thought through, well, this might be something for me. Now it's, here's why you should join us. Here's why you should join Army, and here's all the things that we have available to you. So there's the partnership on the entertainment side, plus what we need to do to make sure that we're addressing those misconceptions. So that's, that's one. Moving on to number two, because these are very widely different topics um, on the ASVAP. So um, OSD is responsible for the ASVAP, and we do continuously review it. And we actually have an external board of experts um, that are not affiliated with DOD whatsoever and includes um, uh, psychometricians and, and other folks from uh, the corporate board and other organizations that are, run the SAT, the ACT, other, other standardized testing programs. Um, and I think that there's often this misconception that today's ASVAP is the same ASVAP from, you know, 1980, and that is not true. It's constantly uh, evolving. It's constantly being revised. We change out components of the test. Um, and we do look at kind of the, the norms. Um, you're right that the last time it was normed was 1997. Um, our board, our external board, did a recent review in 2020 to determine whether or not it was necessary to norm it again. And based upon national test scores across the country, not DOD data, Department of Education data, and state data, there had not been a significant shift in education outcomes from 1997 to 2020, which is interesting. Um, we do think that there is still value, potentially, and maybe um, working with those that conduct the national studies post-COVID to make sure that they look at that again, which would then subsequently inform whether or not we need to do a norming process for, for ASVAP. Part of that could include looking at whether or not it's appropriate to include a calculator. Um, you're right, the other tests do include it, not on all math components, but usually one or two. Um, and then the other ones that don't include the math components, because we want to see if you have some level of mental math ability. ASVAP is, uh, the math portions are largely based on ninth and 10th grade math. Um, and we want to make sure that you have some of those fundamental basics. 
We also want to make sure that you understand even how to use a calculator. Um, folks have probably heard me say before, it's important to know those kind of math principles before you can apply them even with the use of a calculator. So one of the, the test questions on the ASVAP is what is the square root of 27 divided by 3? If you know that you need to kind of work it, you know, with the, your order of operations and what steps you do first, you're going to get one answer, the correct answer. Most people who are not necessarily familiar with how to use a calculator are going to work that problem left to right. Correct. They're going to hit square root, divide, you know, 27 divided by 3 on the calculator, and I think you get an answer of like 0.333, which is the incorrect answer. So you need to know how to do your basic math principles before you can even apply a calculator. And frankly, what we find is in some of our um, applicants that may have had lower education opportunities, their school systems or their individual school may not have been as strong, that's not something that's being taught to them. And so our concern is that in introducing a calculator without doing the necessary work to understand how best to do that, then it could actually have an adverse impact with ASVAP test outcomes. And so all of this is something that we think through continuously to make sure that the ASVAP is um, providing a level of outcome to determine are they the best fit for the jobs. And I think that there's a lot of times an expectation or a misunderstanding that the ASVAP is somehow an academic test. And while it's built on academic principles, it's really an employment test. It's really designed to correlate whether or not we think that you will perform well in basic training and first term of enlistment. And right now the current test does. But there's always a need for constant re-examination and potential improvement. And to your point, if the national norms indicate we need to do that, we'll do that. And as part of that, we'll take another look at whether or not it's appropriate to include a calculator. Yes, and, and if I can may, I'm a, I'm a numbers person. Uh, if I may add on uh, to that, to follow up with your point, if you don't know how to solve a quadratic equation, putting the four-function calculator won't help you. If you don't know how to dissect what's important in a problem, in the, in the problem-solving portion, then that's not going to help you. Instead, um, if it, it's kind of an equalizer. If you understand how to do a quadratic equation or you understand how to divide you know, multiple digits into each other, then it's more of an equalizing factor to negate the time. You know, not that you don't know how. And then, and then the other point is, again, when you take um, norms of the entire country to, to decide whether or not a test, uh, the, the norm needs to be adjusted, then again, I would consider the actual population that is likely to be um, the most affected by adding a calculator and make sure you're not taking the top percentage of, you know, the echelon that if they're going to get a 92 GT score, then it didn't matter. But for the people that it does matter, and since we're in an organization that releases cat fours, then again, this could be an equalizer at some point. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, this, this question is actually really more uh, designed for uh, Ms. Boland to answer, hopefully, and be able to you know, offer us some uh, opportunity to look at talent in a different perspective. Uh, so EY has taken large strides towards integrating neurodiverse talent uh, into your company's regular operations. Uh, as the chief has asked us to kind of look at talent differently, how, can, how do you think the Army might be able to leverage neurodiverse talent into the future? Thank you. So this one's near and dear to my heart. At one point, I was the chair of a board called Achievement Centers for Children, which actually had um, children across the spe spectrum. Um, so what we did a few years ago is we started looking at our business and what our clients' needs were. Um, we were looking for a lot of talent around technology, data, and how to use it. And we were... It's hard to find. I mean, I will tell you, you know, there's, um, we, we could hire more cyber specialists, more technologists, um, but we can't find them because it, it's a really hot, um, hot uh, skill. So what we started doing, and this is kind of part of our whole recruiting, is where else can we find those skill sets? And we tapped into the neurodiversity um, population. And I will tell you, um, not only has it been the right thing to do for our clients, I mean, they, they have, they perform brilliantly around some of these incredibly technical, data-driven um, projects that we work on. But I will tell you, we have changed people's lives. We have changed people's lives. People who couldn't get jobs before because of their, you know, of, of the neurodiversity. We actually, they have professions, they have careers. And so I will tell you, it's, um, it's something we experimented and we piloted. And now we have multiple neurodiversity centers around the country. Um, and we are tapping into them. They are finding innovation around some of the projects that we do across the board. It is, it's incredibly 
proud moment for EY to have really kind of um, pioneered that. Thank you, ma'am. Sir. Uh, Gil Sanborn, I'm a civilian aide to the Secretary of the Army in Northern California, the, the, the acronym CASA. And this is the, the panel I've been looking forward to for four days because I spent about 95% of my CASA time on this issue. And of my waking hours, about 90% of that is spent on CASA work. So I love doing what I do. I'm also uh, on a civilian side, I'm pure civilian, uh, a crisis manager. And I've seen this coming for 14 years since I've been a CASA, just in slow motion. Uh, and the, 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 the term used previously was the civilian military divide, but now we look at it as 91% and 9%. So I'm the poster child for the 91%. And I look at that 91%, not in terms of the kids, but all of the people who get between us and an intelligent conversation with, with students. It's the parents, it's the educators. And I'm in Northern California now, Marin County, cover the Bay Area and points north. And I tell the recruiters, this is the, the Mount Everest of recruiting challenges. But what I found from my experience uh, in Connecticut, and thanks to General Ham, who choppered me into Schweinfurt, Germany, when I was looking for a unit to adopt, and it was the Dagger Brigade, 4,300 soldiers, and then I uh, uh, brought my whole town in to support that unit and learned a tremendous amount. Fundamentally, what the opportunity is in terms of connection and access, which is what I focus on all the time, is that direct personal connection and interface with people in uniform. Let me narrow my question down to, to the fact that, that that access has to be developed on a grassroots basis. And the national media coverage really has more downside than it does upside. In other words, people pay attention to the negative stories, but they pay attention to stories that are local to them involving soldiers or activities that are local to them I think in terms of changing their attitudes about the military. My question is, and what I found is that there is a gap in terms of coverage and relationships with local media, TV stations, newspapers, et cetera, because what I see in the recruiting side is the focus there is on media buys. It's, it's not in terms of planning stories. And at the ACPA level, it's, it's a national focus. And to me, the opportunity that we have is developing those local media relationships, which I do as a, as a constant effort, and I did it with Fleet Week. We're involved in Fleet Week in San Francisco, just collecting cards and collecting those relationships with reporters who were oriented toward these kinds of stories. So, so question to you all is how we're basically reorient ourselves in terms of this crisis so we get better local media access. Yes, I'll start and then the others may have some, but agree. First of all, thanks for your, for your support as a CASA and all that you've done for many years. I love it every said. single day. And Def, we want to leverage assets like yourself uh, to help us influence uh, all those markets and all those corners and all the streets. Uh, but we're, in looking at the crisis we've had, uh, have seen that there's uh, some opportunities both in national marketing and how to message that and what the effect in local marketing also. Part of it's budgeting, which we're working through. Uh, no assistance, well, I won't say no assistance required, but not put it at this level. But how can we better leverage marketing? And the, the message that might resonate in uh, Peachtree City, Georgia, is different than Boise, Idaho. And also talking, working with people like yourself to talk, talk to those influences to just share the 91%, as you mentioned so, so perfectly, with all those soldiers they want, want to join, the coaches and parents. So yes, uh, it, it is part of our renewed, innovative focus for recruiting in sessions, and we know we need to get at this, because it did not work as well as it could have, or we would have the 9%. Well, and, and this doesn't require dollars, uh, because what we're Correct. doing is developing those relationships. So it's free, it's just a question of cultivating the relationships. 
But definitely, it, it, it's going to happen, and we, we're going to leverage that as well. Anybody else want to talk to that issue? No, sir. I, I agree 100 percent. I think access is very important, and, and when I think through the local media, and sir, I know we work together very closely, especially in your area of support, uh, and thanks for your help with the access, is really how to uh, uh, further relationships with both uh, influencers in the area, social media, and then there's another part to this, those tangible things like the RPI uh, and PPI, which are the nice glossy pamphlets that talk about, hey, uh, service to uh, your country, or what is it, uh, what's the U.S. Army all about, uh, or your what they call PPI, or the, um, the backpacks and the big, you know, water jugs. That's, you know, in my mind, that's local brand placement. When I walk into my, my room or office, I see my big Army coffee cup. Uh, just reminds me uh, each and every day. So you're, you're right. It's all of the. You have to think through all of those in terms of how you really penetrate uh, the local zip code. Because I can tell you by zip code where we are witnessing success, uh, and when I can tell you over time it's going up and down. Uh, but what what I'm trying to figure out is the why, and it does the local marketing, does the uh, relationship, does those things I just talked about play an impact. And bringing that up or down, right? And I would I said generally we refer to this as like earned media, um, and and we've tried a lot of this. It's a challenge, and perhaps you know you and others can help us. Is that there's not always an interest from local media to actually air it. Um, it's not exciting. It's not necessarily dramatic. These good news stories that help get out, you know, the word about how military service is a positive experience. Um, or, you know, from a local, uh, you know, somebody that is from that local hometown and what they've done. And so, um, you know, even recently we were trying to place an op-ed uh, about uh, the value of military service and, and couldn't get, you know, primary media outlets to run it as an op-ed. So, uh, you know, we, we do need your help and that of others to kind of signal to local media outlets that you're interested in hearing and seeing this content such that we can probably get, uh, you know, our foot in the door. What I've found is what resonates is when people in uniform help civilians, particularly saving lives. We had two recruiters who were in the Tan Fran Mall, two shootings. I was with the company commander. I said, we need media on this. And the next night, we had five TV stations covering it. Uh, so, it, And then with the fires in Northern California, bringing engineers down from, from JBLM, the focus is on how do we sell those stories because when people in, who are civilians may have a negative view about people in uniform, but if they save their life, that changes instantaneously and those are the types of opportunistic uh, situations we need to exploit. No, we're short on time. Erica Ford I'm from EY. Um, I'm an Army brat. My dad was an intelligence officer. I was born on Fort Benning. Uh, you know, that's where my dad met my, met my mom. She, two one-year tours in Vietnam, medevac pilot, pilot after that. Um, so I grew up very much in the culture, and there's certain things about how I go to my day-to-day. -day. Like, I have a hard time not saying yes, ma'am, you know, or yes, sir. <laughs> Even in the, the job that I have and the role that I have at EY, I just, it's just that my default. So there's so many things about culture and teamwork um, very much is very much ingrained in me from how I grew up. One thing that I noticed from the Gen Zers, which I know is the, the, the folks we're focusing on recruiting, there's two things. There is this um, individualism. There's definitely a focus on purpose and wanting to help people, but there's also a focus on individualism. What's special about me? What do I, what, you know, why should I be here? Why should I invest? And at the high level, that can feel um, incongruent with this idea of Army as one. And so, I, so one question I have, so it's a two-part question. One question is from an outreach perspective and even thinking for EY, do you come in as a team or a very team-focused organization? How do you balance that when you're recruiting folks from that bracket? Then the other um, piece of it, too, is that there's this sense of um, always wanting change, you know, and, and not wanting things to be settled. But there's a lot of um, 
gift that comes from, you know, you, you can do a lot of change within the Army, but there's a, a big gift that comes from that as well, of predictability, of being on a path, and that kind of thing. So just, and the last thing is the language. I don't know if you've ever sat in a room with 18 to 25 year olds. Um, I'm 44 years old, pretty smart. It, sometimes I have no idea what is going on. <laughs> and so, you know, with that in mind, you know, with the army and the culture, it's so strong, the language. So I sat here and I un understood what was being spoken about. And at the same time, there's like an accessibility because when you're talking to an 18 year old, it's not that they're not smart or they're not educated or not eager, but they might use words that the recruiter might be triggering for the recruiter because they don't understand. So when you have those factors flying around, whether you're recruiting for a big place like EY or Army, how, do you, how are you factoring that in into your strategy? Um, I, those are really um, great points, well made. Um, it's interesting, we collect a lot of focus group data and whether it's at an OSD level or a service level, we preview you know, and test run a lot of our content. And it's always interesting to see you know, that feedback and, and kind of what resonates with them um, or not. I think one of the, the points you, you hit on is kind of what, what's in it for me. You know, they're, they're driven for, with purpose um, and they, I think in many ways, they are, you know, they do a lot of community service. Um, they really do, you know, they're, they're focused on how to improve the situation around them or the community around them, but at the same time, it's often kind of on their terms or what's of interest to them. So how do you balance that? Um, we've also seen in our data kind of this trend to entrepreneurism you know that's what they're interested in I think part of that is driven by like the TikTok and the YouTube um, era where there's a, a view that if I just make my own content if I just do this and I will be successful and I kind of control my own destiny um, and then how do we respond to that I think there's a lot of ways that military service and army in particular you can choose your own adventure because there's so, so many different varied paths and we have to do a good job of helping to explain that to people in terms that they understand. Um, and that can be challenging. But one of the ways that we found that to be successful is kind of showcasing both success in service and then also their ability to pursue their passions outside of service. There's this mindset and the data demonstrates this, that there's this view if I join the military, it's all or nothing. My life is gonna be 100% army all the time. I can't have a dog, I can't have a family, I can't go hiking on the weekends. And we know that's not true. Um, and so some of the most successful media campaigns we've seen in Army or the other services is ones are ones that help model being able to be successful in both and meeting your passion in both dual tracks. Um, and then also once we've kind of captured that interest, then even start having conversations about, well, what component is the right fit for you? Um, is it active? Is it reserve? Is it National Guard? Um, and and that's, that's sometimes hard to do, but it, you're right, we have to do it all usually in 30 seconds or less and then in a language that they understand that speaks to um, both altruistically what they're interested in, but then also what's in it for them. And I, I think that Army does a particularly great job of that and in seeing some of the new content that they're also planning on air, I think it will really hit the mark in that way and, and look forward to your feedback. I could just follow up on that briefly. Um, on the front end, getting back to the idea of showing them the many, many different ways that they can serve, all the different types of jobs and training they can get coming in. Uh, and then also, from an, their enlistment options that could be designed to get them having a sense of more ownership in what they're putting together. And of course, once they're in, for their professional development as they go along, making sure that they continue along a track that's appealing to them which should also help with retention. Right, and I think just to um, add to that on the retention side, I think the Army Talent Management Market um, does a really great job of being able to give members kind of a greater sense of ownership of what that journey looks like. Um, and, and that would be hard to necessarily showcase in advertising content, but I think in terms of having a positive service experience, then, then I think that that definitely pays dividends. Can I just, t I know you're, you're anxious to get going. Um, so first of all, well done on the branding. She's got EY yellow on, so well done. Um, 
But, but I think, to your point, so Gen Z, I mean, this is, it's a topic we're doing a lot of research on. I encourage people to really do you know, just thought leadership around Gen Z because it is an incre incredibly important question, is how do you balance that teamwork, which in our world is really important, with that sense of, you know, we hire people that have high intellectual curiosity. And so when you start talking about upskilling and some of the creative things you can do, um, several years ago, because of that desire and demand to continue to expand their business acumen, we set, we set up something as simple as called EY badges. There's 250 badges you can do. You can't do it in two hours. It's actually pretty fulsome of a process. But you can get a badge in AI. You can get a badge in... Um, data analytics, you can get a badge in leadership, you can get a badge in uh, diversity and inclusiveness. So there's 250 topics. Some are more ex you know, expansive than others. You can get a bronze, silver, and gold. But it's one, it's a measure of pride in showing that you've got some specialization and skill sets that are going to serve you well, not just this moment in your job, but and it, it was just a creative approach to, to figure out how do we do that balance, right? Teamwork's important, but we know each of you individually may have different perspectives and wants and needs for your own career. Hi, Dave Grant from Smarter Base. Uh, great information on recruiting. Um, I wanted to get a question in on retention. And so just curious, uh, I read in the paper a couple of days ago, I think it was a quote by General Klein that said, while recruiting was down, I think it was by 14 or 15,000, uh, retention actually surpassed uh, expectations for this past year. And so it made me curious as to, are there goals for retention? Uh, average you know, length of service is the goal to increase that over time? And also, what are you seeing as the major causes of people um, not staying on or maybe re, uh, retiring early or moving out of the force early, particularly one's uh, causes which you think there's some leverage to reverse that to extend the, the length of service would be my question. Thank you. Okay, well, I'll, I'll start on that one, and you are correct. We mentioned the three pillars up front of you know, our sessions coming in, recruiting, <laughs> retention, and attrition. And over the last year, historically high retention was great, historically low attrition, which is also great, and you, uh, you identify the, the uh, recruiting challenge that we're working with. But what we have seen, once a soldier's in, and they have some of those opportunities that are offered to them, the purpose as well, have all boosted a desire to re retain. You'll re-enlist and stay in. It may be in the same job, promotion opportunities, or another job. So all of those are things that we're looking at in, this, in the innovative approaches for retention. And you even want to bring in more. But at some point, you do need young enlisted boots. So we'll, we'll focus there also. I would like to highlight something that's a relative, not a totally new initiative, but it's definitely uh, boosted over the last year or two, is an exit survey. Like, why did you get out? And it's also identified in their transition program. And it may be, I just want another opportunity, or I'm ready to go to college, which is great. But in, if something else comes back, feed that back into the system on how we would what, like to improve quality of life and opportunities for those that want to continue to be retained. On the attrition issue, I know you didn't ask this specifically, but you know, from the time someone goes through basic training, sponsorship, and transition to their first unit of assignment, that gap, needs, that, that path needs to be pretty fluid and maintain the quality as well, because he or she is probably going to retain also uh, past their first assignment. So all that's factored in as well. Um, and given all of this holistic uh, look, these innovative approaches, yes. Uh, what more can be looked at with retention, whether it's enlistment times, re-enlistment re re windows, bonuses that may come with it, or just additional opportunities. Uh, you're an infantryman today, which I recommend you stay. A bad joke, but uh, other <laughs> opportunities as well that you could go into. And to, to, to really boost all opportunities when those three pillars that I mentioned, the recruiting piece, retention piece, and attrition piece, all feed into the strength that the Army needs. Very thank good. you. Anybody else? Sure. Oh, OK, thank you. Thank you. I do have one question here. I'm going to, it's directed mostly towards Dr. Orvis with RAND. And I'm sorry, I suddenly got a tickle in my throat. How can we better utilize simulation tools, such as the <clears throat> recruit selection tool to affect change in recruit characteristics? So the recruit selection tool followed up everybody who came into the Army enlisted between FY01 and 11 for six years, looked at uh, quite a variety of their characteristics, and saw how that played out in various forms of attrition or problems, the rates of problems they got into in the first term. Uh, it can be modified also to look at retention, and it had a cost element also. So if you're thinking about looking at eligibility criteria, 
this can give you a sense as you're thinking about designing a program of which things look like they can help you and which things look like you don't want to go there. And some of the surprising things about it, sometimes you might get, let's say, an increase in attrition to a certain extent, but the amount, when you put it together with the recruiting resource model, you're saving resources. Even though you've got to put, bring in and train more people, at the end of the day, it's more cost effective for the Army. So that, that can be used as you think about, uh, that's a simulation tool can be used in designing programs that deal with eligibility. Thank you. Mm -hmm. At this time, we're going to be um, moving to closing comments, closing remarks. I'm going to start at the far end, Dr. Orvis, and we'll come back towards me. And I won't put you through the gory detail on the analytical side this time. <laughs> <laughs> So the first area was strengthening recruiting, and we talked about expanding the general market, that people know very little about service. There's a wide variety of things they can have as jobs and get trained in, benefits and pay. They have concerns that are not founded. And we talked about trying to appeal to different college market subgroups to increase penetration of the college market and the fact that different subgroups those that take classes while they're serving, those that want to do it before, those that do it after, they're going to require different kinds of programs that are tailored to their particular interests. We talk about uh, increasing the usage of marketing relative to enlistment bonuses, and um, that, of course, needs to be done in accordance with the size of the accession mission and the re difficulty of the recruiting conditions, because one size does not fit all. You get different mixes that are optimal. We talked about leveraging analyses to help recruiters increase productivity. So we talked about uh, some research would suggest that if you account in more detail for the difficulty of recruiting submarkets, basically the mission boxes. So we're talking about high school grads, one to three alphas, senior alphas, and others. If you do that in an area, it gives you a better way of deciding how many recruiters ought to be there and what the mission ought to be. So it should increase productivity. Although USREC does a pretty good job of that, I would say, historically. And then we talked about strengthening marketing ROI by getting better granularity in the data so we know which tactics actually are better than others. And the outcomes of tactics, different tactics are associated either with different effects in different geographical areas, and they attract different types of recruits. We want to know that. We could also use that to help shape how we market and what the accession cohort would look like that's attracted by the marketing. On the, uh, on the analytical side, we talked about different techniques that are available for program design and assessment, focus groups and surveys, past research results, simulation tools. We talked about assessment. Uh, you can look at attitude or propensity change for some programs. That's what you're trying to affect. Or different uh, types of analyses like multivariate analyses of actually the additional leads or contracts that are produced by a new program. And then we talked about experimental and quasi-experimental designs. Difference being every, everything is a balanced test and comparison area, but quasi-experimental can be done after the fact. We, we've used that to look at local marketing ROI. Uh, experimental designs, they're, they're harder to set up. They require more lead time and effort. And then at the end, I touched on some analytical considerations, making sure that if you're going to evaluate a program, you try to use data that are routinely collected. You don't need a whole new effort for that that you make sure you're talking about causation of programs, not just something that's associated and really do something else. And the difference between a change in the attitudes, we talk about you know, propensity has gone down over the years. We talked about change in propensity as it relates to actual change in enlistments. And the comment there to keep in mind is that is not at all a one-to-one -one relationship uh, because people's plans change. And if somebody who tells you they think they're going to enlist several years later, Depending on what measure, maybe 40% of them enlist, maybe it's half that much. It just depends on what measure. And most people are down in the negative propensity group, so that's where most of the enlistments are actually coming from. So you can't forget about them and only focus on the people who are already are attracted to service. Thank you. Um, next year we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the All Volunteer Force, um, and so as we look across different periods of time where we've had a 
a hard uh, environment to recruit in. You look at what the best levers of success were, and we've, we've really talked about all three of those today. It's principally recruiters, incentives, and then marketing and advertising. And I hope you can get a sense from the conversation and the comments today that the department and your army in particular is really vested in looking at those three areas and what they can do differently and what they can do better. Um, and, uh, and hopefully you've also gotten a sense at how uh, OSD and department senior leadership are prepared to give lift to those efforts. But I think the other thing that you heard from all of us is that we do need your help um, and we do need the partnership with the communities to make sure that we're getting our message out, um, not only to youth but also to influencers so that we can tell the Army story better, we can tell the Department of Defense story better, and that hopefully we can start to broach these headwinds that we've experienced over the course of the last year. Thank you. Well, uh, first of all, thanks. Uh, and what a pleasure it is to be here. And let me tell you, I think you all know I'm all in even though I've got a week under my belt. Uh, but what, what keeps me going, uh, first of all, is I love, uh, you know, services, great nation, but more importantly, you know, of my uh, children, of my oldest daughters deployed right now, another daughter uh, served one daughter Army, one daughter Marine, one daughter JRTC. But bottom line, I want to make sure that my, you know, whenever called upon to deploy, that you have all of the men and women to your right and left, uh, so that when you need to depend on them, uh, you're not putting an extra uh, weight in your rucksack uh, just due to, to manning losses. So this is something that keeps me going, and uh, I want to make sure that we uh, really get out there and share our Army story, uh, share our you know the value proposition of service to this wonderful nation, incentives and bonuses. And you know, lastly, let's just mobilize all of our great VSO, ARAs, CASAs, and really get out there and share this gap from uh, you know the two and the two and a half years of uh, you know missing the Army story. So thanks. Great. Well, I'm totally changing my closing comments from what I was originally after this conversation. I will tell you, it was um, it was fascinating. So one thing I learned today, I did talk to a couple former veterans who are now my colleagues, and I'm very proud of them. They're actually working um, with many of you um, in the audience. And I learned that I think we're really good at recruiting, but one of them told me that they had to find us, we didn't find them. So it's a continuous process. I think that's probably words of wisdom for all of us. There's always, a, it's a journey that we're on. But I think the conversation today was really interesting to me because we talked a lot about branding, the importance of branding um, around recruiting, but also using data and really truly understanding who your stakeholders are. But the thing that struck me the most is the power of the story. I will tell you, I was, I'm just struck by every pers person who came to the microphone has a sense of pride and it really, really represents the Army incredibly well and t they tell a story and it's that power of story, um, I would just encourage all of you to tap into that. We're doing that in, in different ways around diversity and inclusiveness and we've got a couple programs out there which are kind of showing our culture of belonging and our culture of care. But I'm telling you, it, it was, it's palpable in this room, and um, I think you should all be really, really proud of that. And last but not least, thank you so much, all of you, for including me, but most importantly, for your service. All the great key points have been made. I definitely want to thank the distinguished and diverse panel members for this. And I want to thank you for your in seriousness about this, so your thought-provoking questions. Uh, a lot of good things here. If you're in uniform, you're a recruiter. So help with the effort. I'm sure the chief would say just that. But more importantly, for those who have served or are supporting us, CASAs and others, uh, this is a, a, a big total team effort, and we will not succeed and we will succeed at this. We'll, we'll turn the challenge, but in order to deliver that Army for 2030 and get ready for 2040, we'll continue to be innovative in our talent management approaches, and we will turn this recruiting challenge to an opportunity that we're going to continue to march forward on. So thank you for your support, and again, total team will get this done. Thank you. Thank you all. Again, I would like to thank the audience for taking the time to asking the really tough questions and offering some pretty solid solutions as well. Um, and to the panel, thank you. And on behalf of the AUSA president, General Brown, there is a small token of our appreciation from AUSA at each table side. Uh, that's your gift, and we made sure we played with the right rules. So if there's anybody in here, the cost was not cost prohibitive, just to be certain. 
So we appreciate all of your time today. Um, I don't know whether any of the panel members can hang around if anybody has additional questions. I'll be here and happy to take them under advisement and we'll get them back to the rest of the panel if you have additional questions. Thank you all and have a good afternoon.